have with us the resource person Dr. B. Ramakrishnan sir, who is principal scientist in the division of microbiology IARI, New Delhi. Dr. Ramakrishnan earned his bachelor's degree in the agriculture from Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, Coimbatore, and his master's from J.B. Pant University of Agriculture and Technology, Pantnagar, and his doctorate from the division of microbiology IRI, New Delhi. He joined the Agriculture Research Service in ICR and worked at Central Rice Research Institute, Katak, Odisha from 1993 to 2010. He had a sabbatical at Max Planck Institute for Terrestrial Microbiology, Germany in the laboratory of Professor Ralph Cannon in 1999 to 2000. A Fulbright Fellow at the University of Massachusetts in the laboratory of Professor Derek Lowley in 2007. And Endowed Research Fellow at the University of South Australia, Adelaide, Australia in the laboratory of Professor Meg Raj and Ravi Naidu in 2011. Dr. Ramakrishnan sir has joined the Division of Microbiology, IRI in 2010. His research interests or research areas are on the micro-mediated nutrient recycling and microbiomes of the soils and plants. His publications are more which are being listed in the Google Scholar. He learned the use of QPCR using light cycler at MPI for terrestrial microbiology Marburg in 2000 and applied biosystems at University of Massachusetts in 2007. Since 2014, he is extensively applying this QPCR method in the field of microbiology for studying different aspects. Today we have with us Dr. Ramakrishnan sir, uh, who will be dealing on the quantitative PCR or QPCR, its principles and practices. The topic is on quantitative PCR principles and practices. Okay, I just wanted to start with a story, which all of you must be knowing. Rather. So when Akbar went for a walk, he went along with Babel and he thought like uh, he wanted to know how many crows are living in his kingdom. So he asked Babel, how many crows are there in my kingdom? So Babel said like there are 95,463 crows in the kingdom. Then Akbar took, uh, took some, maybe was surprised. He asked, what if there are more crows than you answer? So Babel said like, well, if there are more, then some of his friends have come from the neighboring kingdom. Then he, he asked, what if, if there are less crows? Then he said, no, some of the crows from my kingdom have gone to the other kingdoms, OK, visiting the, his friends. What do you consider? His answer is smart answer? Really? You know, we all been taught how to be smart. So we were given this particular tale to become a smart guy. But if you look at the science behind the whole counting process, you think it's a scientifically a correct answer? No. So now what are the ways we actually have like, uh, to count birds? That, like, before going into genes, I want to know from you how, what are the ways we normally follow to count the number of birds in any place? Any idea? No, every time you want to catch a bird and then put a marker. <laughs> how many birds you will be able to catch and put a ring. It's, it's interesting, like, you know, if you want to count the number of birds, it's, it's a, not a very scientific, easily, we could easily do that, right? If you know there are only four or a few birds in a particular area, then it is easy. But then counting the number of birds in a, in a flock like this is very, very difficult. It's very difficult. So we have certain methods, which I will just introduce you for your you know, curiosity. So we have individual counts, which that's what you mentioned. So it's very difficult. So we also have grouping. We can make a grid. So we, uh, we can understand, OK, in this grid, there are so many birds so that I could count the number of grids in a particular area and say this many birds would be available in that area. So we have selective counting. We have proportions. Also, we have timing. So if, if you know, you allow a number of birds to pass through one area, then you will be able to know how many number of birds are passing in a particular area, then you can count and say the number. Then also you can use uh, photographs, remote sensing photographs or aerial photographs, and then count the number of birds. So we have some scientific methods to count number of birds. So ornithology is not that easy when you, when you want to count the number of birds. Type of birds, yes, we have some methods, right? So again, so coming to your own organisms, how do you count the number of insects? So we have so many estimates given about the presence of ins insects in the global, I mean, like, at the global level. So on the earth, we have, so we also take a pride and say that the more number of insects on the earth. 
how do you say about that? What are the methods which are called scientific methods followed to, to count the number of birds? So now it's, you know, you could appreciate quantitative science is not that easy like the way you think, right? So we have several such uh, instances. Well, in my case, I have a job which is very difficult compared to yours. Like at least insects you are able to see, but in my case, it is only microorganism. How do you count them? So we introduce few methods and those methods are known as, like we use a microscopy and then we use a hemocytometry to, and then put a droplet of uh, any solution which we wanted to count. And the, we use the same grid technique which I introduced to you when I talked about the insect, I mean like birds. So we use that and then say number of uh, microbial cells which are present under the microscope and use them for counting. We also learn how to dilute them and then we did the plating work and uh, we are able to plate them on the medium, on a plate piece and on a plate and then you are able to count them, right? So, but if you have a microscopic slide, slide with so many bacteria which are actually on the slide, <laughs> is it easy to count them? Right, <coughs> so we have some difficulties in counting them. So this, then the knowledge also you know, slowly evolved. We have more about the, the presence of DNA in these organisms which you are able to, which you are able to use, make use of in counting. So our job is not just like we have several organisms or which, which is having a different generation time and also the size is totally different and then we understand about the genome presence on all the organisms. So DNA is the, the common denominator for all these organisms. So it is, it, it, now we could understand. So if you want to study about the organism, well, even if you look at the number of genes, then you are able to add a, a quantitative value to the, your research. So science has got a very important, uh, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, condition. Where no, we talk about science. When you talk about science, you know, I, I always uh, appreciate the word of Rutherford who said, all sciences, either physics or stamp collecting. He said, if you are not able to add a quantitative value in terms of like any measurement, like, you know, say in terms of centimeter or mil millimeter or kilogram or gram, tons, then he said, everything is either physics or you are only stamp collecting. You don't know what is the scientific principle behind it. So and if you are surrendered, we are surrendered by the math and science in everyday lives, making them essential parts of our existence. If you, if you know, like if you are taking a chocolate and then if you want to know the amount of calorie which is present in the chocolate, then it, you know, it is science and math. It is not just the chocolate, right? So you have to appreciate science and math go everywhere. And also he made one another beautiful quote, which he said, like if your experiment needs statistics, you ought to do, have done a better experiment. So if you want to add a quantitative value to the science, then you, know, you need to know how to apply these principles, right? So science is nothing but uh, you know, the process of evaluating proposed models of nature against observed data. So we have physics, chemistry, and biology. But of course, you know, we, in, a, in a science, we, which is an experiment, is consistent with the model, only add further evidence to its validity. So we propose a hypothesis, theory, and all those stuff which you all appreciate. But everything is made uh, complex because now we appreciate it beyond physics. When you go to chemistry, we also know like so much of quantitative measurements are required. And again, in biology, you know, we now bother about the quantitative relationships rather than qualitative relationships. So all these things and put into our uh, particular situation where we need to appreciate between the qualitative observation which we make and quantitative observation we have to make. So qualitative research has got some of the disadvantage, like you know, you can make a small number of observations, whereas quantitative advantage has got like you know you can, you know, a decision making substance or confirmation, and then also statistically robust values which you could come from those studies. So, but often you know these are expensive and time consuming. That's what we are now trapped into. So now I'll take you to PCR mission. So now that like you understand how difficult for us to do a quantitative study. Like PCR, well, all of us must, must be knowing about this particular person who revolutionized the way we look at the, the quantification of you know, genes, all the stuff which you know that. So he developed the idea in 1986 and he was given Nobel Prize in 1993. Shortest period of an invention which got appreciated by Nobel Prize, I mean Nobel Committee. 
So in fact, like uh, he, he used to describe the way he thought about the whole process of PCR. Read those papers, which are really interesting, because he had a job where he has to clone a gene and then put it in a bacterium, make copies, and then use it for oligosynthesis and all. So he was looking for a way to make his job easier. So he thought, like, how can I make this job easier? So he came out with the idea of using PCR. So that piece, that simple, you know, motivation or an idea led into the development of PCR and uh, he got a Nobel Prize. But funny thing is, for that particular inven invention, the company gave him only $10,000 bonus, right? But the same company, when they sold the patent uh, to an another uh, company called uh, Roche, Hoffman Roche, they pay, uh, sold it for $3 million, $300 million. So he was given only small amount, 10000 <laughs> but of course, he got a Nobel Prize, which is about one million, which also he shared with another person. It's only half, I mean, like um, half a million rather of US dollar. So he used to say some uh, very bad words about his company, but well, he got so much of fame. So, you know, when he actually he described the whole process, like how he thought about using that idea of multiplication of DNA using the polymerase enzyme, and how you thought, like how you could bring the old primers together and then you could make copies of DNA. So this is, this is available in several papers. It's worth reading them because these are, although they are outdated in the sense old, but the whole process of thinking, the whole process of idea being put into use, you can appreciate if you read those papers, right? And uh, interestingly, the paper which was sent to na Science and Nature didn't get accepted by the paper which he wrote on PCI was not accepted. So it was when it got published only in Methods in Enzymology in 1987. But the same nature in 2015 put a cover page article on him because of PCI. So that's life, right? So even if you get your paper rejected, <laughs> don't get, uh, I mean, like uh, demotivated. But well, that made the whole thing very interesting for me because the guy got a when it issue right on that, like in nature, to talk about the PCR process. Well, PCR, once the idea came into the, you know, I mean, what you call reality, we have so many versions coming up with all those, like hot start, nested, in situ PCR, long PCR, colony PCR, touchdown PCR, band stamp PCR, multiplex PCR, inverse PCR, real time PCR. I'm going to only touch about the real time PCR because we, do, we are not, I mean, like, well, I'm, the point of introducing you, this idea is, or rather the, the information is, you have to appreciate the, like every small change which they made became a method and also known as a particular way of doing PCR. So one idea went on to give several ideas and we have several methods available when it comes to PCR alone. And this is very important. And quantitative PCR, well, uh, we have uh, Almost 84% uh, of the researchers doing PC, qPCR using hard start DNA polymerase, and almost 79% analyze the qPCR data by standard curve method. So these are a few things which I wanted to introduce you so that you will appreciate how these are being done and why researchers are after this particular process. So I will also add an economic aspect to the whole process. If you look at, look at the global market, Economics, that's what Carrie Mullis said, like economics replace curiosity as the driving force behind research. So he says the, the global PCR market is about 6,000 million US dollar. 6,000 US dollar million. Okay, that's one of the estimates. The other one is about US dollar, USD, 7.1, 7.41 billion of US dollar, that's what, like in 2017 to 2023, you will be seeing a huge, you know, jump in the, the market, global polymerase chain reaction market will be around uh, 10.62 billion US dollars. So the kind of research which we are doing with this, this particular technique is huge. So there are several uh, improvements, several applications coming up on this particular area. So I want to introduce you the guy who isolated, the person who is, who is very popular, or rather, you know, some of us used to have a real, I mean, consider him as a real hero. He is Thomas D. Brock. 
he isolated a, a extreme thermophile in the, and then got them published in 1969 1969 that organism he could describe them like you know they are able to do uh, they optimally grow at the same temperature of 70 the enzyme dna polymerase which was isolated from this organism went on to become the the molecule which was a uh, important molecule also recognized as the most important molecule by science in 1980s or somewhere around and that is this is the organism which he isolated from Yellow Spring uh, National Park in California. So only this development is not there, like it was also further, you know, they actually, you know, what they call is like they cloned the gene, DNA polymerase gene from Thermos aquaticus and put it in E. coli and E. coli became the working house for production of DNA polymerase. So now we have so much of information about the DNA polymerase and like TAC polymerase, that's what we call them. And this is not the only organism. This is not the only DNA polymerase now we are using. We also now use from the other organism like uh, hyperthermophile like pyrococcus furiosus, which is now you could see in the market. Like, you know, they are actually highly, uh, they are stable and 20 times uh, more stable than TAC polymerase at 95 degrees centigrade. So when you do a reaction where, you know, you have annealing and then denaturing temperature where you are increasing to 95, and you should know that like enzyme should be stable. If an enzyme is optimal at 70, but at the time, same time, if you increase the, I mean, like uh, temperature to 95, they will not be stable. But you, you could find some of the, org I mean, like uh, organism which are having the capability. What is interesting about is these organism they multiply, replicate using these enzymes. In a, in fact, like if you look at a bacterium, bacterium has got a doubling time of 20 minutes to few hours, maybe days. And you know, if you look at the way PCR reactions are done. We normally take about an hour, 45 minutes, more than that. So if you look at, like, do, learn more about the, the way they do replicate or they polymerize, the enzyme polymerase is used, then you will probably get more uh, insight into the whole uh, process. You may also develop a few, a few in, uh, rather improvements in the PCR reaction at all. So I'm just showing you a couple of pictures to appreciate like how PCR has evolved, PCR machine has evolved. If you look at the PCR mission, which was actually in 1983, you know, you will see they, they have a few incubators, uh, like water baths, which are having few you know, temperature differences. And one has to take the sample and put it in the other one, then do all the reaction. This was what done in the beginning. Then came in 1985, Perkin, Elmer, and Cetus in a joint venture, they came out with the thermal cycler one DNA, which was marketed. And this was actually used by the group by Psyche, like they, in fact, like you, that was a paper which was published in, uh, in uh, 1988. This came up in science. So the one which he missed in 1983, he could also come out with the another one in science in 1988 by Carrie Mullis from CETA's group. So they, they mentioned about like <coughs> the primer directed enzymatic application of DNA with the thermostable DNA polymerase. That's where they introduced the TAC polymerase and this became a popular, popular uh, uh, machine in all the laboratories. So in 1989, they, they, there was an important paper where they could even, you know, what he called amplify the DNA from ancient bone, which was, they used the thermocycler one DNA, which was a very interesting machine, like, and then Perkin Elmer came out, now we have so many other models in the market. Well, uh, in, the, in 2013, they all, they came out with the 30 years of thermal cycle innovation where they, some of the like uh, thermal, if you go to thermal fishery, there are articles and block on uh, PCR mission where they introduce the different kind of uh, innovations which are, uh, which came up in the, in the PCR reactions and PCR instrument and how they are used uh, for all our understanding, okay? So as I told you, like we have several uh, methods, hot start, touchstone, and all this got some kind of, uh, you know, advantages in terms of specificity, yield, and the time required for running the reaction convenience and specific and speciality applications. So I'm going to talk more about the quantitative PCR. So we have now conventional, where the conventional approach is to isolate the DNA, use it in our reactions and reaction cups, and then I quantify them using the PCR. But also you could do it in a direct PCR. Samples are directly put into the PCR machine and you are able to do that. So there are a lot of improvements. All these improvements came just because we could understand the process of replication in the biological system. So there is 
if you understand more about this, then you can make more innovations in the whole process. It's not that like we have to use what is available. You could also make new improvements. Point was, point, there is a reason for telling you because now we have you know, limitations of PCR reaction because it takes about uh, one hour. But if you look at the bacterial system, back, microorganism, they just grow within 20 minutes, they double up. How do they do? You should know like, what are the conditions which we could improve the PCR reactions, right? The replication is an enzyme gown process in which a new DNA molecule is formed by the process of semi-conservative DNA replications. So some of the ideas which we had about these, the molecule itself, DNA molecules are now completely changing. What we thought is hydrogen bonding is important for DNA, DNA or uh, double stranded nature is now being now replaced by an another thought where water molecules are considered to be important. The recent PNAS paper which was published in September this month is, is throwing out the hydrogen bonding importance and say that say more about the, the importance of water in the structure and maintenance and then expression of DNA. Right. So you know the there are we use uh, we could understand more about the leading and lagging strands how the how the DNA molecules gets replicated. So based on that only we are able to introduce the primers and all. Right. We have several enzymes which are involved in it. So we are making use of DNA polymerase, which is an enzyme, synthesize the new DNA strand by adding the nucleotides the growing DNA strand. And also in the nature we have helicase, topoisomerase, primase, DNA ligase, and then there are primers which are nothing but a short single stranded RNA molecules. And DNA polymerase needs some base to start the replication, so they make use of it. And uh, so these are the information which we need to consider if you wanted to do further improvements. Also, the key concept is like uh, these molecules are able to double up. Like the doubling time, which I saw, I was saying about the bacterial system, you are able to see it in the case of PCR. So when you denature it and then do the first cycle, then two to about two copies. It goes on with every cycle, it increases into twofold, and you have multiple copies, which is coming out. By, by the reaction 30th cycle, you will have 10 to the power 9 copies. So again, some amount of mathematics is getting into the PCR machine, right? So well, we also know that there is an important uh, uh, factor which we can consider when we set up a PR, PCR reaction that we call temperature of melting or melting temperature, right? So this is a temperature which is defined as the temperature at which 50% of the double stranded DNA is changed to a single stranded DNA, right? So we know how to set the handling temperature using this information, how to select the primers, all those things. I mean, PCR, someone knows how to talk to you about this, or you can also read from your own, uh, I mean, different sources. I'm just uh, showing, this is, I liked it. Uh, to, I, I want you to appreciate this particular uh, picture. We are, which was actually by a company called BioSearch Technologies, the road taken, Gary Mullis. This is one thing which you, I mean, like you should appreciate. This is a notebook where Gary Mullis has signed and he wrote PCR and all the reactions as written. How many of us have the habit of writing everything in the lab notebook? You should, because this is an evidence and the claim which you could make for peace, I mean like Nobel Prize, they have, it's all from this, starts from this. Otherwise, in our competitive field, if you don't have a record of what you are doing in the lab, somebody else will say that, no, I have done it first. You know, you, you, know, you are doing it afterwards and then they can take the climb out. Okay, so this, I, it's a lesson for all of us, like the importance of keeping a lab notebook and taking down whatever we wanted to do in the laboratory. Well, uh, these are the couple of missions which I wanted to introduce you. Like uh, this is the one which uh, I used it. Uh, I mean, like biosystem, 7,500 uh, real-time PCR, and also now I have light cycler, this in the lab. In all, I'm not getting into the physics, uh, the optical detection system of real-time PCR, which I don't think we will be able to understand in a single class. Like, but they, we make use of the fluorescent property of the light and which is now like we use a fluorophores and we are able to quantify them. All those developments have led to the, the uh, compact size mission. Mission is not so difficult, it's not so big, it will be like just like this only, even smaller than this. Imagine we have, you know, 
matured or evolved from the water bath which were used in the beginning in 1983 to a very compact machine in the laboratory. So much of invention that has gone into the, the into real-time PCR. So when we talk about quantitative PCR or real-time PCR, we have two types of nucleic acid, DNA and RNA. So DNA, you can use either probe-based real-time PCR or qPCR, or also you can use a dye-based qPCR, okay? And RNA, yes, you can do with the semi-quantitative, I mean like real-time PCR, quantitative PCR. There are one-step method and two-step method where you can convert the RNA into DNA and then make all the measurements. Well, uh, in the real-time PCR, so we, when you talk about the, the type of uh, measurements, the whole principle is on the use of fluorescent dye. So the physics of fluorescence and the properties which are now we are making use and then put into the machine. So it's all nothing but the use of fluorescent dye. The kind of fluorescent dye which you select is very, very important. The amount of nucleic acid present into the sample is quantified using fluorescent dye or the fluorescent labeled oligos. So when we talk about the probe based, we talk about the fluorescent labeled oligos, but otherwise we use directly by fluorescent dye. So we have real time where hydrolysis probe based method so where sequence specific probes are used, that could be a, you know, a linear probe or a molecular beacon or a scorpion probe. And then when you use an intercalating dye, which gets into the minor and major group of the DNA, then we call them as fluorescent dye or DNA binding type. Dye are used. So these are the two major types. So when you talk about the, which method to use, depends on the kind of experiments you want to perform and what is the cost of doing that experiment and knowledge and expertise of the expertise of the researcher. Like, what do you understand by the method? What do you, how do you like to interpret your results? Those also sh should be known. And the type of material which you wanted to use for your whole analysis. So we have DNA binding dye. The dye has its own fluorescent. Once dye binds to the double standard DNA, fluorescent emitted by the dye increases 10, 100 to 1,000 fold than the original molecule. So we have a single, I mean like uh, when the dye is you know, they are able to go and bind in a single standard uh, DNA, they will not be able to bind, but they will be able to get into the minor and major grooves and then the bind is going to give you the signal which could be amplified, right? And this is what detected in uh, your equipment. So in real time, so we have a major dye which is now currently used in several laboratories, cyber green dye chemistry, which is a highly specific double standard DNA binding dye to deduct PCR product as accumulating during PCR cycles. Can you answer why we are not able to use single standard DNA? <laughs> we won't be because we are interested in only amplicons which are double standard rather than single standard, okay? So we are, we, okay. Small molecules that bind to the double standard DNA can be divided into two classes, intercalators and minor group binders. So we bother about the intercalators. So we wanted to have like those which are binding to the two strands. Requirements of the DNA is uh, increased fluorescence when bound to a double standard DNA. That's very, very important. The dye which you select is very important because it has to bind with the double standard DNA then you are able to, able to quantify the fluorescence. And there is no inhibition of PCR. It should not act as an inhibitor for PCR reaction. Although we talk about the DNA polymerase, but if the dye is an inhibitor, then it is of no use. So we use a cyber green now. Along with the cyber green, there are other uh, I mean, there are other dyes, but uh, well, if you look into the cyber green dye chemistry, so the, during the PCR, DNA polymerase amplifies the dark target sequence, which creates the PCR products or amplicons. Cyber green dye then binds to each new copy of double standard DNA. As the PR, PCR progresses, more amplicons are created. Since the cyber green dye binds to all double standard DNA, the result is an increase in fluorescent intensity proportionate to the amount of PCR product produced. So this is very important. So intensity should be proportional to the, the number of amplicons which are generated during the PCR reactions. But it, uh, so the, the advantage is it is used to monitor the amplification of any double standard DNA sequence. No probe is required because we don't need anything other than the dye and which reduces the assay setup and running cost. Cost is very cheaper because the dye is alone used. See, it may generate false positive because if you have a primer dimer forming, then the dye can go and bind there 
and the time dimer is also counted okay and it is non specific binding is also sometimes seen so this cyber green dna chemistry is now recommended for mass screening microarray validation multiple target genes and few samples which you can do that and even to detect pathogen and then gene expression analysis so some of the other places it is not you know in other method you know for purposes is not recommended so you need to use another method right so cyber so you need to understand about like what is the chemistry which is involved in qpcr and then select what the experiment which you wanted to do accordingly you have to select well and if you look at the fluorescent chart when it comes out from the real time pcr you will be able to see those fluorescent which are seen at the in the beginning that means the templates are abundant in number more in number so they are able to produce it that you are able to detect them but few are in the later stage that means the initial concentration of the dna is less so we have melting curve produced at the end of the real time so this is important analysis so once you use a melting curve method then you will be able to know whether uh, i mean like this is a important aspect because once the amplification reaction is completed the fluorescent signals are recorded and the template is melted for the determination of non specific bindings so you can find out whether they are non specific template is melted using heating the dye dissociates and the fluorescent signals are reduced so when you actually heat the whole reaction the template the double stranded will now become single stranded so all the dye will come out some of those will come out so the larger sequences takes more time and higher temperature for melting while non specific bands melt at low temperature as different melting temp curves so this is important aspect so when you have a amplicon which is a you no know, longer one then they will take time to separate and the amount of you know fluorescent molecule which comes out is also you know very less whereas smaller one non specific bands will easily give out all the molecules right the data are plotted in a fluorescent versus melting temperature curve so, so this is another aspect which you should all know that that graph is known as dissociation curve or the method is called dissociation curve analysis so this is an important method to dissociate the like non specific binding and the binding of interclading dye like cyber green with the amplicons okay so if you if you plot that dissociation curve you will know specific product like amplicon you know then you will have a melting curve like this whereas a primer dye will be having a lower one so we have fluorescent versus temperature right so small in very less temperature low temperature these will all get separated you will have a fluorescent intensity in a higher temperature this amplicons will slowly release the fluorescent fluorescent molecules or dye and you will be able to see in the intensity fluorescent versus temperature right so this also used so to know the difference between the 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 wild type and the homozygous nature or heterozygous nature of products which you want to analyze right so the principles are used in the melting curve analysis or dissociation curve is used to know about the the binding specific binding and non specific binding and also about the intensity of fluorescent signals which you will be able to quantify so i talked about this particular thing fluorescent dye based real time pcr so we have a double stranded dna template which will denature you know when they denature the mol uh, the cyber green all molecules will not be will not be binding to the double stranded dna so they come out but the primary annealing happens then the extension goes on at that time these molecules can go and bind and you are able to see the intense fluorescence because of from this double stranded dna but the other method is called uh, dna probe based uh, real time pcr so we create a probe which is having both fluorophore and the quencher so we have a probe is an addition which is very specific for the the area of you know interest or specific to the template which you want to amplify and it has got a probe and i will just explain to you in a couple of other slides so we have probe based deduction method which is using linear probe or molecular bigans so a linear probe or the tagman probe so they use the tagman polymerase enzyme and then they make a probe out of it and it, it is depending on the activity of the tag uh, dna polymerase the probes are the labeled short single stranded specific sequence specific dna molecules which are uh, fluorescent labeled so it's a single stranded 
probe, okay, molecule. So, probe is labeled with the fluorescent dye called reporter molecule or the fluorophore, which is situated at the 3 prime end of the, I mean 3 prime end. Probe is labeled at 3 prime end and the other one has end as having a quencher. Just because the reporter and quencher are very, very you know, close by, they will not be able to emit fluorescence. But the moment they are you know, separated, then they will be able to emit more fluorescence. So, the when the probe based method, not only the probe, but all the DNA, tag DNA polymerase plays an important role. Tag DNA polymerase used in the real time PCR has a three, 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity. So, when they are moving, they have a 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity. So, that will remove the probe by extending the DNA. Well, you have to read this concept so that you will appreciate the, the probe based method. So, I am explaining to you like the probe is making use of not only the fluorophore or the reporter and conjure principle, but they are also making use of the, the property of tag polymerase having this particular exonuclease activity, 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity. So, we have several such fluorophores which are available in the market, FAM, Tamra, Tamra and then uh, several of them which are now used, but well, I'm not going to list all of them, but I'm only going to, I mean, like uh, explain to you how it is working. So when a tag polymerase moves forward, it will, it is going to have a five prime to three prime exonuclease activity. It will, uh, you know, throw it out like this fluorophore and quencher, and the probe is now slowly, like this, these two molecules will come out. Then they will have a fluorescence. So tagman probes are hydrolysis probes. That's what we scientifically use the term hydrolysis probes which are labeled at the 5 prime end with a fluorophore and 3 prime end with a conjure. Vicinity of the two conjures, the fluorescent molecule. Since they are together, there is no fluorescent signal. The probe hybridizes to the template and will be displaced by a polymerization process. They will be displaced when they are, when the polymerization is proceeding. And the, as the amplification of template proceed, the displaced probe is degraded by the 5 prime exonuclease activity of tag polymerase, okay. Fluorophores are like FAM or TED and the quenches are Tamra. This is quencher, this is fluorophore. So, this is what we use in tag man assay or probe based assay of QPCR. So, the main advantage of probe based method is we can use multiple probes for a multiple template DNA sequences. We can amplify multiple templates in a single reaction efficiently. So, in the er earlier case, we are able to amplify only one type of template. Okay, here we can use in multiple because you can select different uh, probes with different fluorophore and quencher. Okay, and uh, but one problem that occur while limits uh, I mean, which limits the tag man probe based technique is. The same annealing temperature is not possible for both primer and the probe. So, when you have selected, the temperature should be totally different for the probe and the primer. And usually, the, the annealing and the extension step is combined at 60 degrees centigrade. After the denaturation, the probe hybridization and primer hybridization extension are done at a single temperature. But at 72 degrees and the extension, tag will be at the highest activity. Therefore, instead of removing the probe, it can facilitate the stand displacement of the probe. So, there are some technical difficulties using the, the annealing temperature, what we call as a melting temperature of the primer and the probe, right. So, you should also take into those, so take all of them into account. There is another type of uh, probe which we call them as molecular bacons. Molecular bacons are operated under the mechanism of thermodynamics thermodynamics in which a molecule remains in such a condition where the majority of energy is saved. It is like a hair pin loop structure like uh, instead of binding non-specifically the molecular beacon remains as a hair pin structure. So, it has got uh, you know few uh, what you call uh, they have a hair pin loop like structure of the oligonucleotides which has a complementary sequences on both ends. These are sequences which are complementary which is having one end is having fluorophore the other one is having a quencher molecule. The central loop is having a complement to the target sequence. So, that is the kind of a probe you have to select. So, it is like a hairpin structure. Some of you must be knowing about the hairpin structure 
secondary structure of DNA molecule and all those sequences and other things. Those principles are applied here. So, we have just to rem remember that this is having a complementary sequences okay, that bring the, the two strand the two ends together okay, and we have a central loop and the, the bases which are available are complementary to the target sequence. Right. And we, because this, are, this is now it is formed as a hairpin like structure. So, in the, to, in the end, we have a 3 prime where we have a conjugate molecule, in a 5 prime, we have a fluorophore molecule. So, well, things get slightly complicated. So, quantification becomes a bit, uh, you know, it involves several uh, principles. So, you should appreciate them when you are going to use these methods. Okay. Cyber green is simple because you only need a dye and quantify the number of genes, but it is a, sometimes you have a problem because it can also bind non-specifically, but these are very specific. Okay. So, when you use a, a probe like molecular vegan, so when they are, when, uh, when you increase the temperature, it will form a single standard DNA or rather like when you have a, an, uh, during amplification, you have a single standard DNA coming out, right? And that, you know, because it is having a sequence similarity at the central loop, this will go and bind, molecular bacon will go and bind to the single stranded DNA which is amplified in the reaction, right. So, when they go and bind and these two ends become open. So, when you have a quencher and fluorocore, when they get open, like when they get separated, then you will have a signal intensity improving. So, that is what they are using it. So, I will, I will also, this is only for you to understand, there is a, it is not that like we have a beacons like by a type of probe, but it is similar principles are used. But you know, instead of using two different probes and the primer, the hairpin loop is incorporated directly into the five prime end of the primer itself. So the hairpin loop is introduced into the primer. So we have to design a primer which will have a hairpin loop like structure. So this at least you understand. So we have a intercalating dye directly which where cyber green is used. We also have probe based method for quantification where we have TACMIN assay and molecular begins and scorpion probes. Well, some of us may not be going into all that level, but you should appreciate that when depending on the resolution or accuracy you want in your data, you have to select which QPCR method you want to use. Right. So, again, like all this being done, but you need to know how to analyze the data. So, suppose you got so much of data, but you don't know how to analyze them, then you are in, in trouble. So, when we talk about a quantitation assay, is nothing but a real time QPCR assay which measures the amount of nucleic acid target during each amplification cycle of the PCR. What exactly we are measuring? We are measuring only the fluorescent signal. We don't measure the number of copies of DNA assays, like amplification, we don't know, do that. We actually measure the fluorescent. So, that has to be now changed into you know, DNA, copy DNA quantitation or RNA quantitation using one step reverse transcriptin polymerase and chain reaction. This is RTPC. Probably Dr. Kumar would have talked to you about this. And then we have a RNA quantitation using two step uh, RTPC. So, there are a couple of uh, terms which are introduced where when we talk about the amplification products, we say in terms of amplicon, it's a short fragment DNA generated by the PCR process. And we have an amplification plot where the plot of fluorescent signal versus cycle number. So we, we earlier we saw fluorescence versus temperature, right? Here we saw we are going to see about fluorescent signal versus the cycle number. And there is a term called baseline is the initial cycles of PCR in which the little changes on the fluorescent signal because in your reaction cup you have fluorescent molecules plus all the other reagents. So the baseline fluorescence is the baseline fluorescence. Then we have CT, threshold cycle, is a fractional cycle number at which the fluorescent passes the fixed threshold. There should be some level beyond which only you can take them as increase in the fluorescent intensity. That is known as CT threshold cycle. And we have a NTC, no template control, a sample doesn't contain any template. It can be used to verify amplification quality. So actually we then we call nucleic acid target, target could be either DNA or RNA and we have a passive reference and all. So, when you plot this fluorescent version cycle number, then you have a baseline. This is the baseline, right? This is the fluorescent signal which you see. Then it will start increasing because molecules are now getting amplified and signal is coming because we have more amplicons coming up. 
And this is a threshold which we call as a baseline threshold. Beyond that only we will take into the consideration for our study, quantification. So this is a CT value, threshold CT, and then we use this information for all our measurements. So baseline is the initial cycles of PCR in which there is little change in the fluorescent signal. So there is no change in the fluorescent signal. But CT, the fractional cycle number at which the fluorescent passes the fixed threshold NTC, no template control. So that's, that's where we wanted to do all the quantification. So we also use another term called quantification cycle, that CQ term. In addition to CT, we also use the term CQ. When the DNA in the log linear phase of amplification, the amount of fluorescent increases above the background, then the cycle, the fluorescent, it's known as quantitation cycle, okay? So these are in, you know, used by different companies. Some companies would like to use CT, some will use the word CQ. Accordingly, you should know what to use. So when you plot them, so the basic principle is at the lower cycle number, the fluorescent emitter represents the background noise. That's what we, we all understand because when you have a you know, low num, low, at the low cycle number, the amount of fluorescent is very, very low. Once the increase in fluorescent is linear, this is where the linear level, the threshold line can be used to divide the background level from the specific signal. This is what we call CT. And the difference between the total fluorescent emitted and the background is called delta Rn. And this fluorescent value is typically displayed in amplification plot. This is what they, they actually give it in the, in the software of the company and in most of the machine. So the cycle number in which the amplification curve crosses the threshold line is called crossing point, CQ, or CT. Okay, so there are a few words which are used here. So again, put it into this, we have now, we have an increment fluorescent signal at each point of that you can do that. And also, you know, the CT, this is what actually used in both the cases, like in whether it is cyber green or tagment, and then it will give you an idea like what is the amount of template which is which actually is added into the PCR reaction and then you will be able to know when exactly the fluorescent signal is increasing and that will be helpful in, in, in quantification, right? So coming to the absolute end result, there are two methods of quantification. So I said, one is absolute method, absolute in the sense, we just wanted to know and compare the CQ of sample with series of standards. So these are, we create a standard uh, in the template in a, in a diluted manner and then when you have a, you know, the template which when it is more, then you get the signal quickly. When you have a diluted template, you will get the signal at the later cycle because the amount of fluorescence will you know, depend on the, the number of molecules which are produced, our amplicons are able to synthesize. So we have more DNA, more template, you have a fluorescence quickly coming up, you know, and then if you have a less number of copies, then fluorescent comes up the later. So making use of this, we are able to able cal calculate the amount of I mean, uh, copies or DNA template which you, are in, which you are interested. And also you can use by relative method where you can compare the CQ of one sample with that of another with or without the correction for efficiency. So that also you can do that because that's a relative method. So we have absolute quantification. So now we are moving from, uh, you know, now we are, like how to make use of the data and calculate the amount of template. So we use absolute quantification, which is created by diluting a nucleic acid sample, typically a plasmid oligonuclear data purified PCR product. So we, what we use as a template has to be serially diluted so that you know those dilutions are again run separately and then fluorescent signal is actually, I mean like quantified. And then you can use an unknown test sample which, I mean, whose amount you can interpolate it from the standard curve extraction. So you have to draw a standard curve with, with the copy, the, um, the fluorescent signal or the number of, you know, copy, copy numbers. From there you will be able to interpolate it. It's something like what you do with the, like the spectrophotometer. So you need to prepare a standard curve with a series of um, diluted sample. And that could be coming from a plasmid or oligonucleotide or even a PCR product. So once you do with a PCR product from a normal I mean PCR, use it, dilute it, you have to quantify it. So we need a nano drug to quantify the amount of copies which you have in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sample. So these standards are used. So 
actually what you need to do is like um, you, to take care about the identical amplification efficiencies of the you know you should have both the what you are measuring what you are using as a standard should be of the same of the same otherwise you know they will have a different uh, efficiency of you know, amplification accuracy at which uh, with which the standard samples are quantified is very very important so we need to know like how how can you prepare a standard curve so there are other two methods of uh, you know relative quantification one is a comparative method what what we normally do is the relative quantification compares the expression of relative to a housekeeping gene so we use a housekeeping gene and that we quantify and then and then another reference sample is is you know compared and which is used to analyze the gene expression of an exam example over time or after some treatment so this is what we do with the having both the, we we select not only the gene of interest we also select a housekeeping gene so that we can compare the expression of those two and uh, we use comparative ct method compares the expression levels of two samples from a single from an example's gene of interest within a sample a and b and the full change in expression of gene of interest in sample a versus b it can be described by the log to the fold difference in ct values there are a couple of equation which are available with the each uh, i mean uh, real time machine which you buy they also will give you how to how to do the comparison and also you can use a normalized method where uh, a normalization is done to a reference gene whose expression is theoretically identical to the two samples then corrects for the total rna or dna levels and ct of the reference gene is subtracted from the ct of the gene of interest so we have equation to talk about that okay then then this formula is used to calculate the fold change in the expression of gene of interest that takes into the amount of normalization of the reference gene called delta ct method so there are a couple of methods which are available point is you have absolute quantification where we use standard curve we have relative quantification where you use two different methods which could be either comparative method or normalization method i'm not getting into that because once you get a machine like once you go into the i mean like a real time experiment then you can use it depending on the kind of a resolution you want with the number of data i want to put you i mean example I'll give you an example if you want to know how many i mean like uh, persons are within the campus of iri what will you do what is the kind of resolution or precision you want to know this number is going to vary okay if you take the number of people who are in the campus at morning 6 o'clock is going to be the only people who are living within the campus and 9 o'clock all those who are coming inside outside people who are going will also be counted by around 10:30 only the students and the staff who are working in the campus you will be counting but and then by afternoon the whole scenario changes so what is the level of precision you want to measure that's more important so what is the method you want to do whether you want to use that information for what do if you are talking about hiv particles viral particle you know like if you make wrong measurements what is going to happen the patient is going to die right if you want to know like what is the number of you know how in bacteria which is present in my sample on my skin i can be little you know i can use a cyber green method to know okay the number because the moment i wash my hand they will also get washed so that my, it depends on the kind of a resolution or the precision you want want to know for the quantitative measurements all these things beyond i mean in addition to that we also know you should know about the efficiency of qpcr we are talking about a reaction we are using polymerase enzyme we are using certain conditions but you should also know what is the efficiency of production in the key and one of the pictures i showed you like theoretically with every cycle you need to have a 10 to the power i mean 2 to the, 2 to the power 2 increases okay that's that is a kind of increase we want to see but actually does it happen in the reactions no it may not because you have inhibitors sometimes you introduce you when you are introducing a template dna template if the template is not pure but it is coming out with several inhibitors what will happen so when you introduce some ions like other than magnesium but if you have some other interfering ions then the efficiency goes down so you should also take care about the efficiency so theoretically like what we desire is like we should calculate them the exponential growth of a amplicon concentration in the reaction mixture 
can be described as an exponential function of the template starting concentration. So this is what you have to measure. Theoretically, in the beginning, it may look like 2.04. It may be even more, but slowly it gets, you know, goes down to 1.84. So there is a reduction in the person because reaction gets a lot of inhibitors accumulated and polymerase may not be efficient. So all other factors which you need to, to consider. So to talk about it, the efficiency is a measure of amplification quality, depends on factors such as the primer GC content, primer mismatch, and the presence of PCR inhibitors. If efficiency equals to two, the number of amplicons doubles per cycle. This is the, the matter which we need to consider. The efficiency is 100%. Two distinct methods can be used to, to estimate the efficiency. The first can be estimated from the fluorescence increase in using linear and nonlinear regression model. The second one can be estimated using slope of a dilution series. There are ways one can estimate the efficiency. These are the two methods. So we have absolute and relative quantitation method. We also have efficiency, two methods, the fluorescent increase, that is efficiency FI, fluorescent increase. Then the other one is efficiency by dilution series, EDS. So there are a couple of papers where they proposed uh, different methods for quantification. I like the one which is published by published in the Journal of you know, Applied and Environmental Microbiology where they talk about the simple absolute quantification method correcting the quantitative PCR efficiency variation in the microbial community samples. So this is one such one. Like there are several papers on on the on the quantification methods. Okay. So where they talk about the like standard curve method, like the equations are given in it and how to make use of this and to quantify the, the amount of samples which you, you have it in a PCR reaction. So, well, I'm just, uh, these are the two, I mean, like, uh, you know, amplification plot and standard curve which are used in this paper. This is very important because we need to understand these concepts before we interpret our data. So data collection could be easier, but if you don't know how to use the data, how to interpret your data, and otherwise your conclusions are going to be wrong. So it's better to know these aspects. So we have absolute and related quantity, quantity, quantification. So where we talk about several methods. So this is the one uh, slide which will sum, summarize several of them. Probably you'll be given the whole slides in your, I mean, you'll be giving to the candidates, I don't know. But you can, you know, you need to appreciate like the kind of, uh, I mean, drawbacks and advantages of these two methods. So then also there is another method which I wanted to, I want to introduce to you is high resolution melting analysis, which is actually a post PCR technique used to identify genetic variation or methylation status of a genomic DNA. So once we know melting counts are used to know about the binding or non-specific binding, the same method is also now used in, a, in another in a analysis we call high resolution melting analysis, where the temperature is, you understand, like every degree or less than that, is used to know about like, you know, about the genetic variations and methylation status of the genomic DNA. The, re the region of interest is amplified in a reaction containing double stranded DNA, binding dye with the fluorescence brightly only when bound to a double stranded. Well, you understand about the high resolution melting analysis used to know about the, the, the variation of the gene of interest and also about the methylation. So they we use a different plot, uh, difference plot technique where they are, you know, the changes in the uh, differences, I mean, in terms of uh, fluorescence and then uh, temperature versus is used, and that will give you about the, the actually status of the uh, mutant or the wild type, all those you, know, you could use by using QPCR. And also QPCR is now applied for copy number variations of clinically important polymorphism caused by either gene deletion or duplication or inversion. So if you have a gene of interest which you wanted to know whether uh, there are polymorphism related to gene deletion, duplication and inversion, then you can make use of it by this analysis, relative quantity and devices, you know, the fluorescent signals, then you will be able to understand about the, the copy number variations in the gene. So I'm just, although I, I, I mean like I mentioned about clinically important polymorphism, you will always, you will have a similar situation in all their insects. Right, so polymorphism can also be studied. The point which you all have to appreciate is, we we are now able to quantify this two DNA and RNA to some extent using qPCR. What is not possible is protein. 
if someone can come out with a very simple method, like the way Carrie Mullis could come out with a PCR for protein, one more Nobel Prize. Okay, I used to joke with my students, it is simply waiting for you if you are coming out with a process method where you can quanti I mean like multiply or amplify proteins so easily, like the way we do with the DNA, then it's going to come out, it's going to give fetch you a Nobel Prize. That's very appealing. <laughs> Some of you can take the challenge. Well, and then to, there is a mistake. It's a real-time PCR or QPCR. So depending on the, you know, you know, the, I mean, the kind of analysis that, I mean, my experiment which you wanted to do, you can apply this into several of them. So all these things are listed out because each, going to each one of them is something different because as you appreciate, like when PCR is introduced, we have so many variations, variants in PCR machines or types of uh, PCR which are used to, to amplify because each one has got a difficulties in amplification. So PCR application is also, like qPCR is also so much, like you can apply them in different uh, conditions depending on the requirement which you have. And uh, when I talk about real-time PCR efficiency, which is very, very important, don't ignore the aspect because you can't leave it with the machine to take care about everything because machine, PCR machine will not do many things. What do you introduce? is what they are going to do. In, in computer sciences, they used to say, garbage in, garbage out. So if you make mistake with your sample preparation, DNA and the choice of probes are the dyes which you make, then your reactions are going, going to be totally wrong. So it's, uh, we have a lot of other problems related to PCR inhibitors. Although we, we use uh, different uh, chemicals as a PCR enhancers, so we have difficulties with the PCR efficiency. So it's all, there is interesting book by Stephen, Stephen Bustin. So he came out with a book, uh, A to Z of quantity PCR in 2004. That's considered to be a Bible of qPCR. So I will say you start with this if you wanted to be a master of qPCR because this book gives you an overall picture and perspective of using qPCR for your researches. Although we have, we are bothered about the research uh, problems, but if you don't know about the tool, your problem is not going to be solved, right? You are going to cre create more problems. So this one, you should, you should have an idea like what are those. Well, uh, there are several protocols which are available in the, in the net web or in the laboratories of several uh, professors, okay? You can use them. But all you have to do is, you have to standardize these protocols in your laboratory. Unless you have your own standardized protocol, success is going to be a little difficult. Not difficult, it is even to difficult to even see. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you will have all your uh, reactions go wrong without any amplification. So it will all look like NTC, no template control, no amplification at all. So you will waste a large amount of money on your reactions. Okay. So standardization is very important. There are several ways one has to troubleshoot. So there are troubles like little or no PCR product and poor PCR amplification efficiency, dimer formation, non-specific amplification. This which you see in a normal PCR, you will also be seeing in qPCR. So the, all these things have to be taken into consideration. Sometimes students actually in my lab, they prepare everything, but they forget to add DNA. So I know one of my students, um, she carried out like uh, 84 uh, PCR, qPCR reaction and came and said nothing came out. I said, I'm gone. That day I have 50,000 rupees gone into the drain, right? So <laughs> you should understand about uh, like uh, all these factors because you, I mean, well, and there are several issues which are to be considered when you are talking about uh, qPCR. I'm listing out some of them. These are important. And you also have to be like careful about these factors when you set up an experiment. Well, uh, in, uh, in 2006, uh, I think 2009, Bustin came out with, uh, with a serious request for you know, transparency and reproducibility of qPCR measurements. So he came out with an article which is called, what he called a minimum, I will just read out from the next slide, is there in, uh, information for Quantitative estimation guidelines. Or oh, here, minimal information for publication of quantitative real-time PCR experiments. This is MIQE. 
guidelines, which is published in Clinical uh, Chemistry, which is an important paper because he said, you know, he considered it like, uh, although you can use it for uh, DNA, but if you are using for RNA, then one has to be really, you know, careful about the, I mean, like uh, issues related to reverse transcription PCR quantification. And then he said like uh, cDNA synthesis strategy could also be go wrong and then finally you will end up in making mistake in qPCR. This one, minimal information for publication of qualitative, quantitative real-time PCR experiment is very, very important. So they, this paper is available freely in the, in the web, I mean, World Wide Web, internet. So you can download and read. And there are several you know, issues which have to be considered by each one of us when we are using a qPCR measurement. So this has now been introduced. Uh, well, I just end with this particular <laughs> slide. Again, everything is, should be made simple as possible, but not simple yet. So quantification is also in the same principle. So we know how to quantify, but it cannot be so simple that you can easily quantify. So DNA, right at the moment we are using qPCR. Well, we will come out with the more uh, refinements improvements to quantify the number of genes in your sample. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. If you have any question, please ask me. Any questions, queries? Yeah, must be ready for lunch.